All right, so now let's put together the last two lessons, the F net, the centripetal force part, and the centripetal acceleration. So one last thing we gotta know is there is a formula for the centripetal acceleration. For AP Physics 1 or AP Physics C, I can't really derive it for you. It does take sort of some complicated um, vector analysis to show you that the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. Be very careful, this V isn't really velocity, it is the um, speed the magnitude of the velocity. So it's equal to V squared over R, where R is the radius of the circle, V is the speed of the object. So this is just a formula. One of those that we just memorized, um, the way you wanna think of it is when you want to, like if you wanna think about it a little bit intuitively, if you are making a turn, right? When is it harder to make a turn? When you're going really fast, like if you're driving a car, if you take a turn too fast, that's when you're gonna have a really hard time making that turn. Also, if you make the radius too small, also gonna have a hard time making that turn because you need a great deal of force and great deal of centripetal acceleration if you go faster or if the R is smaller. So that's the intuitive way to talk about at least how the formula is related, but maybe not deriving why it's V squared and not V over R, for example, other than the units. But it's a nice, neat formula. It's based V squared over R. So now let's do it. So let's look at the how we modify the problem solving steps here. Okay, so everything else is the same. It's just now when we identify the acceleration in the problem, step two is to identify the acceleration. We now say, so if it was same direction as velocity was speeding up, opposite direction was slowing down, That's this part was the tangential acceleration. So now, if it is turning, or moving in a circle, then there's a centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle. So that will be part of our identification. And then the other part is if there's, when we're doing the axes and positive and negative directions portion, if there's any centripetal acceleration, then one axis will be in the centripetal direction, one axis will be in the tangential direction, okay? That way we can do that centripetal, we want one axis to have all of the centripetal acceleration so that we can use that V squared over R part. So then everything else do the exact same thing on the problem. There's only two modifications to the way we're gonna break down questions here. So let's con let's go through some examples here. So if a ball of mass M is attached to a strength of length R, negligible mass, the ball moves in a clockwise in a vertical circle. When the ball is point P, the string is horizontal. Point Q at the bottom of the circle and point Z is at the top of the circle. Air resistance negligible. Express all your algebraic answers in terms of the given quantities. On the figures, draw and label all the forces exerted on the ball when it's at P and Q respectively. So this is our free body diagram. At point P, we have gravity. And then we have a rope right here. It, the, it says the rope is horizontal. So it's going to have a tension pointing horizontally, pulling on the object. Point Q. Well, we have MG and what's touching it, only the rope. And at, down here, the rope is going to just be vertical because they say point two um, is gonna be vertical. So then the tension is going to be pointing straight up like that. Cool. Derive an expression for V min, the minimum speed the ball can have point Z without leaving the circular path. Okay, cool. So now they're asking about point Z. So again, point Z, we wanna draw our free body diagram. So let's do it here. So at point Z up here, the rope is like this. So if we look at the forces, we're gonna have gravity pointing downward, and then we're gonna have tension pointing downward like that, because it's gonna be pointing, pulling in the direction of the rope, right? That's nothing new. We haven't done anything new yet. Okay, so now, then we're gonna say, identify the acceleration. Well, the very top of the path, it has a centripetal acceleration downwards towards the center of the circle, because it's moving in a circle. So it has a centripetal acceleration downward, it's actually not speeding up or slowing down because there are no horizontal forces anyway. So there's no acceleration in the X or Y direction. So now we're going to establish our axes, which is we only have a vertical axis. We'll make down positive because that's the direction of the positive acceleration. And then we'll do F net equals MA. The F net will be the sum of these two forces because they're both pointing down. And then this is going to be MV squared divided by the radius of the circle R right? So it's a centripetal acceleration, right? Okay, cool. So that's this. Now we want the minimum, minimum V. Okay. So this is the interesting part, the minimum V. So what happens as V gets smaller and smaller and smaller is the left side has to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So MG can't get smaller. So only the tension will go smaller. So at the minimum V, the smallest it can possibly be is when T is equal to zero. 
Why? Because the tension, because once the T can't be negative, because that would th then imply that the tension's pointing upwards, right? And it can't point upwards because it, the negative direction would be upwards because ropes cannot push, right? Ropes can only pull. So the minimum occurs when that happens. So that's mg is equal to mv min squared over r. Okay, so now what, what, what does it mean? What if it went slower than that? Okay, so let's say the t is going to zero and you say like, well, I can make it as slow as I want. I could swing it really slow. Well, the mg can't change, right? So the only way that this equation can match is if this went any lower, then the mass of the object doesn't change, g doesn't change, the radius of the circle would then change. So if you don't have enough speed, then it will then decrease in the radius. And so that's what happens if you swing up and too slow, it just collapses, doesn't stay in that circular path anymore. So that's why we say without leaving the circular path, that's what's happening there. So cancel out the m's, rg square root, and that's gonna equal v min, right? Just solve for v min there. C, the maximum tension the string can have without breaking is T max. Derive an expression for V max, the maximum speed the ball can have at point Q without breaking the string. So it's like a point Q, what's the direction of the centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle? So we'll make upwards the positive direction, and then we'll do F net equals MA. For F net, we're gonna say, well, T is upward, so it's positive. MG is downward, so it's negative. That's equal to M times the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R. Now, why do we have a maximum? V max is if you increase the velocity, then the left side is also going to have to increase, right? But mg doesn't change, so the t goes up. So eventually, it goes up until t hits t max. So then we would say t max minus mg would equal m v max squared over r. And then you can't go higher than that because if you go above t max, then it will break, right? Because we want to go without breaking the string. So then divide by m, multiply by r, that will get rid of that, and then take the square root, okay? And that would be our expression, r over m times t max minus mg, okay? Uh, so that was c. Part d, suppose the string breaks at the instant it's at point p, describe the motion of the ball. So point p, the velocity is this way. If you were to remove this, okay? Let's pretend we remove the string right at that point. The velocity is upward. How do I know the velocity is upward? Well, velocity is tangent to the circle, tangent to the path that it's taking. So I know it's that's the tangent to that circle there. If I take that off, all we have now is just a downward force. So we have an upward velocity, downward force, right? It's just going to slow it down. So it's just going to be like a free fall. It's going to go up, then fall, fall vertically to the ground. There is no more centripetal, there's no more force that can cause the velocity to turn. We only have a downward force that's going to cause it to slow down, hit the maximum, and then going to accelerate downward. Okay, let's look at this problem. Small block of mass 0.15 kilograms up at a height two meters above. Shown in the figure, it slides with negligible friction around the track inside the loop. Leaves the track at point C here. On the figure below, drawn label forces act on the block was at the top of the loop at point B. So point B, it's right up here, the block. So let's draw the free body diagram, right? We're gonna have gravity pointing downward. Then we're gonna say, well, we have a surface here touching it. Now it's above it, because it's upside down. So what's perpendicular, That it's a surface, so it's gonna exert a perpendicular force outward. Outward from here is going to be a downward normal force. And there's no friction, so that surface doesn't exert a frictional force. And then there's nothing else touching it. So we're done with our free body diagram. Now, what's the acceleration? Well, it's pointing towards the center of the circle, centripetal acceleration. So then we'll make downward the positive direction, the direction of the centripetal acceleration. Then we'll do F net equals MA. And so you say MG plus FN is equal to M times the centripetal acceleration V squared over R. Now, what are they asking? So well, actually, so we, we, we drew the free body diagram that, that handles that part. Calculate the minimum speed the block can have at point P without losing contact with the track. So if you lower V, so think about what happens when the velocity decreases, smaller and smaller and smaller, the left side has to get smaller, right? If we get, assuming we're gonna have the same radius, same mass, like we're staying along the track, because we're not gonna lose contact with the track, then the MG doesn't change. The only thing that can happen is the FN decreases. Right? So if we're gonna bear, about to lose contact with the track is when the FN is close to zero. So if it's barely above zero, 
then we're still in contact with the track. But the moment we lose contact, the FN goes to zero. So FN is close to zero when uh, about to lose contact. Just pretend it's like 0. 0.00001. So might as well just say about zero. So just say FN is approximately zero. That's what the squiggly mind said, approximate. So M MG is gonna equal M V min squared over R, the M's cancel. And so the V min is gonna be the square root of RG multiplied by RG. The radius is 0 0.6 and then G is like 9.8 or 10. And then that would be meters per second. You can, you can use a calculator to calculate that if you want, okay? Let's do one last example here. Block release from rest at position A slides with negligible friction. The block never leaves the track. So he's maintaining track, which will find true of the net force when it has position C. So position C, the block's right here. So let's look at all the forces that are acting on it. We have a downward force, Mg. The, the, the track is right here, it's a surface. It's gonna exert a perpendicular force outward from the surface, Fn, to the left, because it's perpendicular to the surface, right? That's the same rules for our free body diagram. And so nothing else is touching it, there's no friction, so this surface is not gonna exert any frictional force. Nothing else is touching it, so we're done with our free body diagram. So we have a leftward force and a downward force. So it's going to be, uh, has components to the left and downward, going to be E. So that's just about F net. Didn't have to do the entire process there, just the free body diagram.